Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of our Wilson Institute Speaker Series, Self-Isolation Edition. I hope you're all well. My hair has undoubtedly divided academia and become one of the most debated topics on social media. The vote is still too close to call, so you can still vote on whether I should cut my hair or not. Take part in one of the most important decisions in Canadian history. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dan Horner, someone I've known for several years since our time as Wilson Institute Postdoctoral Fellows. Dan is currently a professor of criminology at Ryerson University, and in 2011-2013, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Wilson Institute, where we shared an office. It was a magical time. It was great to catch up with Dan today and talk about his new book, Taking to the Streets, Crowds, Politics, and the Urban Experience in Mid-19th Century Montreal, recently published with McGill Queen's University Press. And now, without further ado, let's go. Hey, what's up, Dan? How's it going? Hey, how you doing? It's been a while. Good, yeah, good to see you. Good to see you in these strange, uh, in these strange times. How's, uh, how's Cynthia? How's the family? Uh, they're all doing, they're all, you know, like it's, uh, it's weird, like we've gotten, we've gotten used to all of this, I guess, at this point. Like it's sort of become, we've accepted it as like what life is normally like. Uh, I think like we spent March and April going like, this is so strange, but now it's, uh, now this is just kind of how things roll out. Um, we're very privileged to have like, you know, we have a, a house with a yard and uh, we bought a, the, the biggest possible kitty swimming pool you can get. So we all spend a lot of time out by the pool. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's not so bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, I feel, you know, I feel we've reached that point in Groundhog Day where, yeah. you know, like where Bill Murray kind of like really, really starts to feel comfortable with his surroundings. Yeah, yeah and he's playing you know, the piano, like he's hammering away at the piano, exactly. like Jerry Lee Lewis. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Kind of that point. yeah we, so we bought our kids a, a, a swimming pool, like a little kiddie pool, but they don't yeah. use it. So, um, so yeah. Um, our kids, so during, it's nice. It's uh, sort of multi-purpose. Our kids use it during the day and then uh, raccoons swim in it at night. So it's sort of like, I feel like we're contributing to the wildlife as well. Who are, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that very, very vicious Hamilton. Wildlife. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so we're here today to talk about your, your, your upcoming book, uh, Taking to the Streets, Crowds, Politics, and the Urban Experience in Mid-19th Century Montreal which I, I think at the time that we released this video, will be out with Miguel Queens University Press. It's out with Miguel Queens. I can oh, show you. Oh, right now. Uh, All right. Yes. Yes. Oh, there, there we go. go. Awesome. Congratulations. Uh, in the soft cover and in the more dignified uh, hardcover version of it. So nice. It's out. Perfect. It's out. I, and, uh, I don't know how many copies you have, but you should definitely send one to the Wilson Institute. And we'll I will get, out. yeah, I will get you the one case. to the Wilson Institute. I've got, I've got copies for... Uh, for all the all the places where uh, it all came together, including the Wilson Institute. So, awesome. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, all right. So, what? What? So, for those of us who don't know your work, what is uh, what's your yeah. book about? So, uh, taking to the streets uh, is about the uh, 1840s in Montreal, uh, which was sort of a um, as students of Canadian history uh, will know, uh, is sort of a, a pivotal kind of moment of political transformation in Canada with regards to uh, sort of the uh, move towards uh, a more uh, democratic political institutions. Uh, it's also a big decade in terms of things like urbanization. Uh, it's a, uh, we see a huge influx of um, migrants into uh, cities like Montreal. Montreal was becoming as in the midst of surpassing Quebec City as the biggest as the biggest uh, sort of settlement in uh, Brit what, what was then British North America, uh, so we saw a lot of demographic change and all of this stuff. And uh, so uh, basically, what taking to the streets does is it, it documents uh, this uh, this transformative uh, and and turbulent kind of uh, decade uh, in the life uh, of uh, of a city, uh, and it focuses on how people use the streets of Montreal as a as a political space uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, so it looks at uh, things like riots. Uh, there was a lot of sectarian violence between uh, Protestant, Catholic, English, and French uh, in, uh, in uh, Montreal at the time. Um, and so I wanted to sort of capture that part of the story. Uh, but I argue that these riots were actually part of a really rich uh, kind of uh, 
popular uh, political experience at the time, because uh, there was a bunch of other political things going on as well. Um, it saw a huge explosion in uh, sort of national society parades where kind of elite uh, Canadian people, elite um, Irish uh, migrants to the city, uh, began hosting things like Saint Jean Baptiste Day parades, uh, Saint Patrick's Day parades, uh, and then there were uh, Catholic religious processions. Uh, so I talk about all these things, and I, I talk about how all these are kind of woven into the experience of daily life in the city uh, in a period where people use the streets differently than they do now. Uh, people uh, worked on the streets, uh, they socialized on the streets, and, and so uh, all these events, I try to treat them not as kind of sporadic outbursts, uh, but as actually woven into uh, the fabric of life in, in the city. Mm -hmm. So um, other than being a Montrealer, which if like me, you're obsessed with everything Montreal, whether it's bagels, whether it's, you know, like smoke me, whether it's everything that makes Montreal the greatest city on the planet. Um, so what else drew you to, the, to, to, to your topic? Yeah, uh, well, it definitely came out of being a Montrealer. I've always been really drawn to uh, kind of understanding the, the history of places where I'm, where I'm living uh, for some reason. That, and from the earliest age, I wanted to, you know, even as a kid growing up in the suburbs, I was fascinated by finding like pictures of what uh, the town I grew up in looked like 100 years ago. So, yeah, I've always been sort of drawn to, uh, to, to Montreal as a, as a place. Um, but then it's a bunch of things kind of converged in the early... In the early years of the millennium uh, for me, and this is really dating me and making me sound old, but um, uh, I had, a, w when I was, uh, so in sort of the early 21st century, I was at, uh, I was living in downtown Montreal. I was going, doing my undergraduate degree at McGill um, and I, um, became sort of interested in politics and started going to uh, going to protests and stuff like that. And all that culminated in uh, going to the summit of the Americas in Quebec City in 2000 and kind of early 2001 uh, and sort of seeing things like riots and demonstrations and stuff like that up close, uh, seeing how they kind of um, this was sort of a, these were moments where you'd see sort of the full, um, the full power of the state in display in the form of, uh, you know, riot cops and tear gas and stuff like that. So I became interested in that. And then um, I was doing my undergraduate studies in um, history and becoming very uh, interested in uh, kind of issues around uh, issues around, uh, you know, class and race and gender and stuff like that uh, in doing my, uh, doing my undergraduate studies. Um, and you know, thinking of thinking of ways to kind of get at those issues, and I realized that um, those uh, those you know demonstrations uh, that I was attending and those riots that I saw kind of unfolding, uh, these were sort of moments where you could tease out some of those themes around around class and gender and, and race and power and authority and stuff like that. Um, you know, and this led me to uh, you know reading some of those classic works on crowds and stuff like that, um, both by you know British historians and uh, American. American historians and, uh, you know, to uh, uh, Canadian historians and French historians and sort of, uh, you know, realizing there was a rich tradition here uh, of reading about crowds uh, and how crowds were one of those ways when people first started writing about this in the 1950s and 60s, writing about crowds was a way of sort of writing about um, people who were often sort of um, pushed to the margins of history, uh, people whose voices you didn't hear in uh, newspapers and other kind of uh, other other source material like that, right? Uh, so it would be kind of a way of, um, of uh, as the old expression goes, kind of writing people into history. So um, that sort of matched up with my political sensibilities. Uh, and so all of that kind of came together. Um, and like I said, when I first went off to do my, uh, to do my master's degree at York in 2003, when I left Montreal, uh, 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 to, to, to go to York to do a master's degree with Bettina Bradbury. Um, I, I still in this, you know, I still thought, well, I'll write about riots and write about, um, you know, demonstrations and stuff like that. And I did my master's degree on the Gavazi riot of 1853 in Montreal. And, uh, and that was really, that was really great. But as I said earlier, like I became really interested in sort of not thinking of these things as sporadic outbursts, but again, trying to think about how they were part of people's daily experiences uh, and how, um, and the more I read sort of historically sort of uh, thinking about, well, how was this, how did this fit into people's kind of strategies of how to survive in, um, the middle of the 19th century, which was a really interesting uh, kind of political moment for the reasons I kind of outlined a minute ago with regards to demographics and stuff like that. But also, um, 
uh, you know, this was sort of the height of kind of the, uh, the, the emergence of a Victorian kind of liberal state. So these were people living, these were often migrants living in a city uh, where they had to perform kind of dangerous and, uh, you know, rough kind of labor, digging canals and working on the docks and where there wasn't kind of a social safety net for them to, uh, for, for them to fall back on. Uh, you know, there wasn't a welfare state and stuff like that. So um, this kind of crowd activity was, became kind of an important way to, um, an, an important way for them to, uh, to kind of build community and stuff like that, whether that meant uh, attending a parade or, uh, you know, becoming involved in Catholic religious processions or rioting, all these things were part of, I started to think about how all these things kind of fit into people's strategy of, uh, of making a go of it in very trying circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, your, your your book is so relevant right now. Like all over the world, we're seeing people taking yeah. the streets to fight and end systemic racism, to defund and abolish the police. So yeah. any similarities between uh, protests in 1840s Montreal and maybe the ones that, we, that we're seeing now? Yeah, one of the big... One of the big kind of uh, themes of my book, and I came to this later, um, uh, you know, just in the past few years as I've been uh, revising it, is thinking that um, at, at the end of the day, there's this fundamental conflict in mid 19th century Montreal between um, this group that I kind of refer to um, as these liberal reformers. And, and these included, you know, both French speaking people and, uh, and English speaking people. Uh, but there were these sort of uh, elite reformers who became very active in this period. And they had this vision for, um, for the streets and for the city uh, that was all about, um, was all about sort of uh, making it easy for capital to circulate, for people to circulate. And they wanted to create this very kind of genteel, uh, beautiful, uh, city and they were really bothered by the way that the popular classes used the street right right whether that meant um, you know uh, people drinking and kind of spilling out of taverns or whether that meant people engaging in political violence and stuff like that uh, and then you had those popular classes themselves who really could kind of advocate for themselves and they could find ways to defend customary uses of public space uh, and so uh, what I found so fascinating about some of the discussions that have been going on for the past few uh, past few weeks, the past few months, has been um, the way that at the forefront of all this is people talking about finding new ways to um, uh, essentially to kind of take back some of those public spaces, right? Because, uh, and this might be a little bit simplistic, essentially those liberal kind of elite reformers, um, they kind of won um, in the in the middle of the 19th century. And the cities that we know today, these cities that kind of took shape in the in the second half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, um, kind of surpassed the wildest dreams of those reformers, right? Um, uh, if you know, if you walk around a city like Montreal or Toronto or Hamilton or New York City. Um, you know, it's all about sort of accommodating the automobile. Um, it's all about sort of, in most cases, kind of pushing people out of public spaces at certain times. Um, there's an enormous amount of kind of police surveillance of people who um, are deemed to be, um, you know, using public space in inappropriate ways. And this is usually tied to their class and racial background and stuff like that. Um, and so those those urban reformers of the mid 19th century, they got to build their cities, right? And what's fascinating in the, uh, here in the 21st century is that um, there's, you're seeing a bit of a push back towards that and people claiming, you know, people claiming these spaces again to, uh, to demonstrate, to use them as a place to uh, organize society differently. And, uh, and it, so that's been, uh, that's been really interesting to see kind of, uh, kind of take shape where you've got some very bold kind of initiatives coming forward that, um, in a way, arguably, I feel like that we haven't seen since the, the mid 19th century, um, people are really kind of sitting down and thinking or standing up in some cases and rethinking, you know, the very foundations of how we think cities ought to ought to work, right? And, uh, and there's social reasons for this, there's environmental reasons for this, but I feel like we're on, um, I'm writing about this one transformative moment uh, in the middle of the 19th century, but, uh, you know, we, it seems as though perhaps we're entering another one of these transformative moments where um, cities 50 years from now uh, won't look and work the way that they, the way that they do now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so is, is there anything that current protests and demonstrations, do you think there's anything that they can learn from the, the ones that we see in the 1840s? Is there like any like secrets from the past? Secrets from the past. That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> Help ensure their success. I'm just asking for interested parties here. <laughs> for interested parties. Yeah, I mean, I think the big one, and, um, uh, you know, it might sound, uh, 
you know, uh, it's, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, but um, the, uh, the importance of, if you look at sort of this, you know, the, the political movements of the mid 19th century, I think there was an understanding of the importance of, uh, of you know, uh, community formation, uh, the importance of solidarity, the importance of kind of looking out for people in your, in your community. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in the, uh, again, in sort of the ensuing, you know, century and a half or two centuries of, um, closer to two centuries now, uh, in the two centuries since, you know, we've really been uh, increasingly kind of sold this idea of, you know, these kind of the liberal individual kind of, uh, you know, an island onto themselves and stuff like that. Uh, and I think successful political movements at all times always show the importance of, uh, of, of, you know, kind of people coming together and supporting each other uh, mm -hmm. and creating these, you know, uh, you know, creating these communities of people who, uh, you know, feel some connection to each other and, and feel, uh, you know, feel compelled to uh, defend the interests not only of themselves, but of the, of the broader community. So, uh, so that could be that could very, very much be uh, be a lesson, and then just uh, again, as kind of I mentioned before, like the importance of um, of asserting a right to uh, to uh, to a public street uh, to a public space, right? Uh, a place like a street or a park and stuff like that, and uh, and uh, you know you very much see this in the in the 19th century. These liberal reformers would sort of uh, you know. Um, try and find ways to, uh, you know, to try and clear people out of the streets and to, uh, you know, to uh, make public spaces work for their own kind of genteel vision of how a city could work. But, um, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, I give in my book a bunch of examples of uh, whether it's, you know, migrant laborers who are digging the canals or, uh, you know, uh, you know, carters and other people who kind of worked uh, dirty jobs on the streets uh, and that performing that kind of rough labor, um, these people would often very sort of forcefully push back and say, well, no, we have a, we have a right to be here and we have a right to use these spaces to advance our own interests. Mm -hmm. So if we can kind of like still stay in, in, in the present. So, you know, as two Montrealers, and you kind of alluded at, 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 at the beginning a little bit, like we're used to taking to the streets, right? Like whether it was to fight for affordable and accessible education or as was fashionable back in the late 90s, early 2000s, fighting globalization. Yeah. However, like with, and I may be referring to some family members here, with each and every protest, there would always be a barrage of condemnations from, from yeah. the media, from the population. You know, like people from the suburbs would always complain that we're making like their, like their, their trip back home too long, you know, it would take them an hour to get back to the South Shore. Um, so how do you hope your book changes public perceptions of public protests or taking to the streets? Yeah, that's, that's something that I thought a lot about and I tried to, you know, I was, uh, I really struggled uh, in, 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 in writing the book uh, with, you know, how to sort of address these things in the, in the, in the conclusion and how to think through this. Um, crowds, the thing, about, the thing about that sort of crowd activity um, is that it is, uh, it's really contentious and it was contentious at the time, right? Uh, so much of the stuff in my book is about, uh, is about these, you know, again, these sort of liberal elites kind of expressing, uh, you know, new ideas about, about making the streets orderly and stuff like that. Uh, and so many of the same kind of language and, and rhetoric uh, is still very much present in our lives. So it was amazing, uh, you know, during uh, during more recent kind of outbursts of crowd activity, the way that people, um, uh, you know, the way that, uh, you know, the way that some people uh, react so strongly to the actions of crowds, the way that they, uh, or, you know, the, uh, the pro, you know, you see how divisive protests can be with, you're right, I uh, kind of people saying, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, this isn't, this is, people should pro find ways quieter and, and more peaceful ways to protest and to make their voices heard and stuff like that. Uh, despite the evidence that nobody really listens to that kind of, to the, that sort of, sort of peaceful protest. I think the power of history um, is always uh, showing that the, um, showing that the, the order of things as they stand, the, the status quo um, is, socially constructed, that it's not, um, you know, that it's not the natural order of things. Uh, and I think when people, uh, when people kind of express hostility towards uh, protests and crowd, you know, crowd things like that, um, whether it's people talking about Black Lives Matter protests, uh, or even much more uh, innocuous forms of it, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard sort of um, people on talk radio complaining about the number of uh, in the summer in cities like Toronto, the number of festivals or, you know, uh, street closures and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, 
and, uh, and sort of bemoaning the fact that, as you're saying, it makes it harder to get around the city uh, and stuff like that. It makes them harder to move their automobiles around in, in, as, as quickly as they would like to. Um, and I think this is, again, this is sort of the power of history to say that, um, uh, uh, to say that this was not the way things always were. And in fact, this is, uh, you know, a very specific kind of political and cultural circumstances shaped uh, the world that we, uh, that we, uh, that we know. Uh, and so I, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I, th I think that, uh, that there's, that there's power in that. And I think, um, uh, you know, you know, liberal kind of elites in there in, in the, you know, the 2020 incarnation of them, of themselves, um, uh, they get a, an enormous amount of power out of suggesting that the way the world works now is somehow natural, uh, that this is, again, sort of the natural order of things. So I think, um, you know, something that I try to do is, is, uh, is kind of poke holes in, in, in those types of assumptions and uh, to kind of, uh, you know, to, to say that uh, change is possible because, um, uh, change is possible because things always, haven't always been the way that they are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, this is just, un I mean, I've, I've known about your work for, for a while now since, you know, we, 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 we shared an office at the Wilson Institute. For, yeah, we for, did. For one wonderful year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I know a little bit about your, 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 the, your process of, you know, changing your dissertation to a book. You know, I witnessed it for a year. So uh, what were your difficulties that you had and the challenges that you had when, when working on your topic? You know, whether it was, you know, at working on your dissertation, but also whether like transforming that dissertation into the book that you have now. Yeah, it's been sort of, it's, it's been a, a long process and one that I, one that I sort of, um, you know, I would, uh, I would get distracted by other projects and kind of put the, put the dissertation away for uh, years at a time. Um, and I'm happy that it's coming out now at this moment where it seems, uh, as you're saying, it seems like it's really pertinent again. Um, I think it's, um, I wanted to write a book that's kind of the uh, the uh, the kind of history that I enjoy reading, uh, and what that means is that um, what that means is it's kind of a it's kind of a messy history without without easy answers. Um, the, the the main challenge of writing about crowds is, uh, especially in the nineteenth century, is that there's not that much archival material to work with. And you're somebody who also knows about you know nineteenth century politics and social movements and stuff like that. Um, mentions of these things are often um, fleeting, uh, uh, and uh, and there's a lot of silence. And so something that I had to do uh, in my work is to um, is to sort of try and fill in some of those silences in terms of uh, by kind of thinking speculatively about things. You know, what motivated somebody to participate in a riot or a parade? Um, you'll never find that in 19th century newspapers because 19th century newspapers, as, as, as you well know, uh, were not like the newspapers that we came to know in the in the 20th century. Um, they were these very sort of partisan things. They were, you know, only a few pages uh, every week, uh, usually sort of filled with, you know, deeply a deeply kind of partisan take on the political events of the day. And so there's not a huge, it's not, you know, it'd be uh, one thing to kind of write this about the 21st century or the 20th century because there's more sources to work with. Um, but in the night, writing on this stuff in the 19th century, I often sort of, sort of tracking down little, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of the, the, the smoke from things. I was sort of tracking down uh, these very sort of fleeting mentions of what life was like on the streets of Montreal and then trying to fill in those gaps. Um, and so it often meant reading things against the grain, kind of saying, okay, here's what's being said. What do I think is not being said? You know, what, what, uh, whose voices are not being heard? And that's one of the big changes that, well, one of the big differences between the dissertation uh, and the book is that, I was thinking in a much more um, a, a, a much more in, intensive kind of way of how to fill in um, how to fill in those gaps and how to think more about um, the silences that are that are that are there, uh, and that's why I hope and we always have lofty ambitions for our books, but I hope my book is helpful to people who um, perhaps aren't necessarily interested in Montreal or are not necessarily interested in uh, you know crowd events, but um, I'm trying to speak to a larger problem, which is um, how do so many people get written out of the political story of, uh, you know, of colonial British North America? Um, mm -hmm. Why are, for example, reading all those newspapers, all, all those sort of judicial records, why do they so rarely talk about women? Why do they so rarely talk about indigenous people? Why do they so rarely talk about, um, about poor people? Um, and, 
And so uh, one of the things I tried to do in the book is kind of address those questions and sort of show how in this moment that we often imagine um, is, uh, we often imagine as a moment of kind of democratic, the expansion of democratic political institutions, uh, we often, you know, older kind of histories of this period often talk about it in this way of, um, uh, it's this kind of celebratory moment of like democracy comes to Canada. And what I've tried to show, do uh, with, in talking about crowds, it's given me an opportunity to look to the dark side of that. Like why are, why are people on the basis of their race, on the basis of their uh, gender, their class, why are they being pushed out of, uh, out of these narratives? And why are, um, how, do, how do elite white men essentially use um, crowd activities to uh, enhance their power through things like parades and stuff like that, uh, and also push other people um, out of the public sphere by saying, well, they're hysterical and they are, you know, they're riotous and stuff like that. So um, those sorts of questions, um, what, it was challenging to get to those. It was uh, easier sort of in my earlier work because I would just sort of take the, uh, the you know, incredible reporting and stuff on crowds and I would just sort of um, you know, I would just sort of parcel them together and that would be a chapter or an article. Um, and it's been, um, I sort of tried to push myself to, uh, to think about some of the stuff that's going on in the margins in all of this. Yeah. I mean, as, as, as someone who, who, who studies the period, but also, you know, public protests and public demonstrations as well. Yeah. Um, I am so psyched about reading your book. I, I Excellent. I, the cover is just, the, the cover's amazing. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was really happy with the cover. I had, I had uh, nothing to do with it uh, other than saying I like it in an email. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it really, it really captured, it really captured things. In a, in a yeah, it, it's kind of funny though when when Julien and I were were working on like the cover for the yeah. our, our rebellion our rebellion book. Yeah. Uh, we kind of got an email from McGill Queen's University Press being like, so we'd like to have your input in the cover. However, you know, just be reminded that our graphic designers are award winning. So yeah. I yeah. think we really don't care. Right? So. <laughs> I think I got that same email. Like we would like your input and uh, also please don't give your input. <laughs> so what's next for you? I mean, obviously other than ensuring the proper education of your children. Since yes, of course. Yes. Uh, yes. I mostly, uh, I'm mostly in the midst of, of, uh, you know, running a, uh, a relatively low quality daycare. Uh, but in terms of my academic, uh, my, my academic work, um, so on the administrative side of things, I'm about to become the chair of the criminology department, uh, all of which, uh, uh, you know, is uh, part of that, that path that I followed since the Wilson Institute. Uh, and then now that the, uh, the book is out, I'm able to throw myself into um, more vigorously into my next project, uh, which is again, uh, you'll be pleased to know, is uh, keeps me in Montreal. Uh, my new uh, work um, um, uh, is on uh, the uh, the urban fringe in Montreal in sort of the middle decades of the 19th century. Uh, so thinking about how um, how uh, a lot of the transformative things that were happening uh, in the city uh, were not happening in the in the in the city proper, but happening on uh, on, on the fringes of the city, right? This is where a lot of migrant laborers were coming to live. Uh, this is where, uh, this is where uh, infrastructure was being built to position Montreal in a, in a global uh, economy. Uh, this is where uh, elites were building these, uh, the, you know, these, uh, these uh, sort of palatial kind of uh, new uh, sort of villas on the outskirts of the city. Uh, this is where people were building uh, cemeteries and garbage dumps and uh, things. This is where there were colonial encounters happening with uh, indigenous people and, uh, you know, uh, uh, migrant laborers and stuff like that. Uh, so it's really looking at, at the role of the urban fringe uh, in the uh, in the city's history and then positioning that in global transformations that were unfolding and impacting Montreal in terms of the transition to uh, capitalism, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, changing patterns of, of migration and urbanization and stuff like that. Uh, so that is my new, uh, so that is my, the, the new project that I am, uh, that I'm currently working on. Uh, and I have a, a grant to kind of build that up in the next few years, uh, which I'm very pleased about. And, uh, and then some of the work that I started at McMaster, which was sort of looking at um, 19th century Montreal and Liverpool in a comparative context. Uh, some of that work is still trickling out. Um, I've still got some material there to work with. So yeah, so those are all the things that uh, now that the book is, is out of the way, I'll, I'll be able to sort of uh, move forward on that and hopefully uh, 
Um, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'll be going on sabbatical uh, next year, so hopefully I'll be able to make a really big book, uh, ma ma a really big push on the on the next book dealing with some of that stuff. But uh, thanks, yeah, thanks for doing this. I mean, you know, it's 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 rare that we get to. Ch I mean, usually when we have chats, it's like waiting for our kids outside of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Louis goes to EK and Ren goes to, to Veneto. We don't have those moments. Anymore. I know, we don't. Yeah, exactly. They both left Strathcona. And, uh, and yeah, so but this is great. It's great to be able to hide up in my attic and, and chat with you. And I'll bring you a copy of the book. Yeah, for sure. Once, uh, yeah, yeah. maybe we'll have to have a, a social distance. Uh, a social distance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we should sort that out. Uh, uh, I'll send you an email and we'll uh, sort out a, a date and time. Yeah, because I'd love to get you. Uh, I'll give it. I'll give a copy of the book to you, and then you can. Uh, it could go once once things are back to normal. It could go on on display at the institute. And yeah, in in a couple of years. <laughs> in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2021. I know. I feel so bad. Like I know it'd be it'd be so much fun to be like organizing book launches and stuff now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know. Oh well, <laughs> there are, you, we're, we're getting very good at doing like online book launches and online events. Yeah, I was um, sorry because I was uh, we were talking about having a, an event, uh, hosting some kind of event, and it's like part of me wants to leave it until we can do it like properly in person, mm -hmm. but then part of me feels like if I leave it to like, what if it turns out to be like the end of twenty twenty one? And people are like, why is he having this launch for an old book? Like, it'll look like I'll look weird, you know? So I don't know what the best way to, the best way to do things is. Yeah. I want like, I want, you know, I spent a decade working on this. I want like people to be at a bar with like drinks and music and. Well, you know, you know? like McGill Queens University Press will just have to release a second edition and it will have- Exactly, a, yeah. A second edition, right? <laughs> But uh, yeah, thanks for coming, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely we'll we'll see you around. Awesome. All right. Thanks for doing this. All right. Later. All right. I'll see you later. Bye.